We are Gold Ivy. Our mission is to empower you to own and unleash your truth. Stories of resiliency are gold and ivy grows in hard places. Those hard places are what creates space for light to shine through. You decide what works for your daily life and how to transform our lessons into your gold. This is Ivy Unleashed, a Gold Ivy production. Brooke, what do you think everyone wants more of? Energy. What do you think most people are hoping to come out of 2023 with? Mm, feel more confident, be an example for others, actually have the self-discipline to take care of themselves. Yes, exactly. Because we hear the need for it and we want to help you get in the best shape of your life. We created Move with Gold Ivy, our virtual workout platform. Our dream has been to create accessible, affordable, and effective workouts that you can do anytime, anywhere, designed to hold you accountable and get you the results you need. You can pick any workout you want at any time, but if you do want a plan that alternates muscle groups and leaves your body feeling energized and strong, we have a weekly plan that you can follow to take the guesswork out. It's easy to navigate and packed with all kinds of workouts that will help you strengthen, trim, pump up, tone, energize, de-stress, all of the things we want our body to feel. It's within MOVE. Don't forget to mention the resources we offer. As a member of Move with Gold Ivy, you'll be a part of our exclusive Ivy League community where we share our top wellness resources on things like meal planning, gut health hacks, time management, and more. And because you listen to the Ivy Unleashed podcast, we want to offer you all of this for only $20 a month, cheaper than any monthly membership you'll find. Not only that, you'll get a free trial week to test it out. And if you need more incentive to start prioritizing you, here's our favorite part. Your movement matters. Each month, 10% of your membership will be donated to support the mental health of those in need. So head on over to goldivyhealthcode.com slash move or find the link within the show notes of this episode and sign up today. Stop putting yourself in the back burner. Snag your spot and reap the benefits that you deserve to feel this year. It's your time. Move for your health, move for your confidence, move for your mental clarity, move with Gold Ivy. Hey everyone, welcome back to Ivy Unleashed. Today we are talking about how in the midst of a sucky situation, we can go from falling to thriving. And to help us with that, we are graced with the presence of author, podcast host, speaker, performance coach, entrepreneur, survivor, the list goes on and on, who I'm referring to is none other than Dr. Nitha Bhushan. Nitha, welcome to Ivy Unleashed. Oh my gosh. I just love the way you said my name. I just, <laughs> I, I love it. I may, I may have been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like one of my homies that I grew up with in Chicago. <laughs> Love it. Love that you're from the Midwest. That's amazing. And we feel like we know you. We feel like we know your whole life story. We feel like anytime for the rest of our life, if we have any issues, we run into a sucky situation and we are going to lean on this book. That sucked. Now what? We love reading people's books. We love meeting authors. And it's just like surreal right now because we just read this in the last 48 hours. And so we're like in the thick of, Oh my gosh, like how are we going to get through this whole book and talk through everything? Because it's one of those books that can sit and wait for you for the next time something bad happens and you can have someone really hold your hand. And so thank you so much for writing this book. I know you've written multiple books, but this book is going to help a lot of people as they experience life and tragedy and breakups and lose jobs. And I'm just so happy you wrote it. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for observing that, sitting in it, reading it. And yeah, it's, it's been a labor of love, honestly. And I, as you said, you know, I've, this is my fourth book, but I feel like this one really is kind of the amalgamation of everything kind of in a girlfriend's guide where you can have a glass of wine and just, you know, reel in the the real life situations that sometimes actually suck mm-hmm. and, 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 and not be so heavy with it. Because I think that's the, the thing that so many people are afraid of that, that, oh gosh, I have to sit in this grief for so long that I'll get stuck in it. And then we don't really move forward, which is why, you know, the book is called that sucked, not this sucks, meaning that we would still be sitting in the suck, but it's to actually honor what, you know, actually happened. So that's why it's past tense of that sucked. And now what, now what, 
to turn a new leaf, turn a new page, and maybe even grow some ivy at the end of it. Ooh, oh, love it. And you walk us through the stages. Like I said, falling to thriving. In this book, it, there's something for everyone, no matter what kind of learner you are. That's something we observed. There's graphics, there's pictures, there's stories. Like it's it's a fun read. It's a serious read, but it's fun. And you can see yourself and your clients and the stories that you share. Uh, but before we dive into that, we really want to get into your story. You are a uh, quote unquote expert of this topic of grief, of sucky moments, because you've been through your fair share of them. So talk to our listeners about why this topic is so important to you. Yes. I feel like I have walked the walk of major unrelenting loss and hardship and heartbreak and uh, multiple adversities all before I was 19. And that's kind of when it all started. And for some listening to this, you know, they may be in the middle of a suck right now. And for myself, my suck happened when I was uh, 10 years old. And so I was 10, the oldest of, you know, two younger brothers and born out of an immigrant household. My dad, my mom wanted the American dream and uh, they came from different places. My dad was from India. My mom was from the Philippines. And so the first, you know, thing that we learned growing up was a strong work ethic. They were tiger parents and it was education and it was performance and accolades and just, you know, the busyness of, of life. And so we were slept, you know, to, uh, piano lessons and dance lessons and, and just performing And that all kind of shifted when I was about 10, when my mom got diagnosed with breast cancer. And so she, obviously, I remember when she got sick, I don't know, shout out to those of you who remember getting the chicken pox. So I remember vividly, I got the the chicken pox and my great grandmother, she was watching me and I felt like, oh, wow, where is my family? Because she was getting surgery that day. So I knew that that particular day was so different because while I was itching and my great grandmother didn't want to touch me or be around me because she was, you know, in her 80s, but she was the one watching while my mom was going through, and I didn't know this, this extensive surgery. But the meaning that I made behind that was no one's going to be there for you. You have to take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. And that was the very first time that, okay, I was going to grab that bottle of calamine lotion, put it all over me. But I remember feeling so sad and even abandoned. And later on that day, you know, they came back home and then they broke the news to me that, you know, and I didn't understand what that meant, but that she had breast cancer. Well, she had battled that for about six years and then eventually uh, the the cancer had spread into her lungs and into her brain. And she passed when I was 16. And so, you know, in a sense, there was a lot of relief because we had grown up literally in and out of hospital settings. Like I would come home, you know, as a freshman, as a sophomore in high school, you know, going instead of what my friends were doing to your practice and sports and things like that, I would go and do my homework in her, you know, hospital bed. And that was so different. And so a year then after that, we would get another tragedy. Uh, My brother would have a severe asthma attack at school. He was 16 months younger than me. And we were supposed to meet, uh, it was homecoming, uh, for both of our schools. They went to lane tech across the street from him and he never made it. He actually had an asthma attack. His lungs collapsed over his heart and just instantly was gone. The paramedics, when they arrived, tried to revive him. And it was a very traumatic, it was very shocking because he wasn't, you know, he wasn't an athlete, but he also wasn't sick. That, I uh, really took our family out for a while. Uh, so much so that my dad went into deep depression. We were just, you know, there was anger. There was, there was just so many feelings yet. I felt like I needed to swallow my, 
feelings because I needed to be strong. I needed to be strong as I was told, Nita, you're strong, you're resilient. That's when I first started hearing about the word resilient is I would hear this all the time from my family, from extended family. And so I felt like I needed to put this face on. And I remember I was a senior in high school at the time. I didn't go away for college. Uh, I got into all of the schools, couldn't leave, couldn't leave my dad, couldn't leave my youngest brother. Um, and it was actually his birthday. And so there was just a whole slew of confusing emotions. And finally, when our family was starting to, you know, climb out of this tragedy and mess that we were in, we would get struck with another, another punch in the gut. You know, almost two years after that, my dad, we were literally getting ready to go to a family wedding for the very first time in a very long time in those years. And my dad, we decided to dye his, his silver Fox hair. We decided to dye it black. Cause we're like, Oh, we're going to the first family wedding. If you've ever heard of Indian weddings, you know, it's a big whole thing. And so, well, he was allergic to the dye. His face swelled up and we had to rush him, call 911, rush him to the hospital. And I mean, my brother and I, we just looked at each other like, oh no, you know, this is happening again. Because when if, if you've ever experienced PTSD in any form or any sort of loss, you're like, oh gosh, is everyone, is everyone going to die around me? A few hours later, they came back with a test and they diagnosed him with stage four lung cancer. And so that was it. <laughs> They, the doctors gave him nine months to live and he transitioned at 10 months. And so at 19, I am now the caretaker of my youngest brother, who is now 14. And wow, was that an overwhelming amount of just sadness and grief. And so I was walking into my twenties with this huge chip on my shoulder, you know, that I'm not going to let the world pity me or my brother. And I, you know, I took on a ton of responsibility and pressure, you know, that I'm going to just prove to everyone that this is not going to phase me or tear our family apart. Wow. Thank you for walking us through all of that. It is really hard to even imagine, but to put yourself in the the timeline of all of that. And then to know now what we know about what you've done with your life, it's like, unbelievable because you've made such a beautiful life from such tragedy. I'm so proud of you. I hardly know you, but I feel like if I could give you a hug right now for what you've done through what you've been through, it's, it's absolutely insane. And I'm so glad that you chose to stay strong in whatever gave you strength. I don't even know. A lot of people would have crumbled and chose a completely different route, but this book, I think the way that you start with that, telling your story, that's what Brooke and I believe sets people free. And you can feel yourself with whatever, whatever tragedy you've been through yourself. You can say like, okay, if she can do that, then I can do this, right? Like I can get through this breakup. I can get through this job loss. I just lost my spouse or I just lost a child or whatever it may be where it's like, you feel like there is no way out. I'm so happy that you've created coaching and a podcast and books to kind of help people through this. There was a point where I needed to actually go into rock bottom because I think that for those, that decade in my twenties was all around trying to prove my worth and trying to prove that I was okay, that I was better than okay, that I was actually chugging along. I was fine. So I went to, I went to dental school and I also, um, I also fell in love and I got married and I did all of the things of the traditional trappings of success that I could gather to create or try to create this new identity for myself that was one of almost like a bulletproof, like a, like Wonder Woman with her shield. But in my case, my shield 
And my foundation was not internally strong. And it wasn't internally strong. There was a shield on the outside, which was going to, you know, literally protect me from, from all of those deep, dark feelings that for an entire decade, I would shove under a rug. I would shove in the back, 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 back closet because I didn't want anyone to know anything. And I would then attract a partner and my love relationships would be the one case where it would start to spill out. And we know this whenever we've been through something or when we have patterns that run our life, maybe different kinds of friends, different people that betray you, different partners that cheat on you, there is kind of a thread. And for me, I had to then go through the biggest courageous moment of my life. And that would come almost a decade after my dad died. I was literally in my late twenties. I had already reached my pinnacle of what I thought success was. I had a cosmetic dental practice with my name on the door that I owned. I had about 10 people working under me, including doctors and other, you know, hygienists and assistants. Yet I was so afraid that people would find out that I was actually in an abusive, physically, emotionally, mentally abusive relationship and marriage. And so all of that internal foundation would crumble on December 31st, 2011, where I would be in my, you know, home that I had purchased with my significant other at the time. And I would be looking in my master bedroom on New Year's Eve in the mirror, fetal position, and just for the first time, fully crying and crying and wailing and honestly scared. But that was that pivotal moment where I had to actually be on my knees and look in the mirror and say, how in the world did you get here? And to admit that I was actually in this situation, this relationship, this abusive relationship, and to actually admit for the first time, three little words that would literally change the trajectory, which was, I need help. And to let people in because I was keeping this deep, dark secret because I was so ashamed of what people would think in our culture. We don't get divorced in our culture. We don't share what's going on behind closed doors. And I knew that if I would stay, it would literally not be good for my life. And so I mustered enough courage that day, December 31st, 2011 was that day when I got out and I left, I would leave that big home that I knew the, all of the trappings of success, the community that was part of that whole world. And I would set forth on a journey, scary as heck, but finally to reclaim my power and have the bravery to then in the coming days, which I write in my book to actually let people in and get a restraining order. Things got even messier before it got peaceful. (laughs) And, but I knew that once I admitted that to myself, literally saying those words out loud, I need help. I'm feeling scared because it was always in my mind and I would just suppress it and put it in the back closet again. But as soon as I let that pressure valve out, it was as if a ton of bricks just like melted into butter off of me. And that's when I started to begin building a new life. That's so powerful. It's the power of speaking your truth and it's scary. It's terrifying for you, I'm sure. As you said, it got messier, but the resilience that you're building through that, through speaking your truth. And in your book, you say resilience starts right as the sucky moment itself is actively unfolding. So I'd love for you to get into what is resilience for you? What have you learned throughout these sucky moments of your life? Yes. So I think that 
what we are told and what we've normalized just in our present society and what we see, the motivation videos that we see online is that, you know, resilience is that mental toughness in that how strong you are and how tough you are. And yeah, that helped me for a little bit that, that helped me get through some of my darkest days yet resilience can also be your ability to be soft your ability to actually you know if you think of the latin root word resiliere comes from latin right well the definition of resiliere means to bounce back and if you take you know i use the analogy of a, a glass or a piece of granite it's hard it's tough it's strong and if we let that go well, guess what? It's going to shatter. <laughs> it's going to break to a million pieces. I have little kids. They, glass breaks all the time. But if you were to take a basketball or a volleyball and you hold that, or even those little bouncy balls that the kids get at the birthday parties, it is tough. It is strong, but it also has a little bit of give. It has a little bit of flexibility. It has a little bit of agility where when you try to squish it, 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 it does, it does give you that little bounce. When you let it go, it sometimes bounces back higher than before. And sometimes it doesn't, but that is the definition of resilience is to make peace with both sides, the strength and the softness, the compassion and the toughness. And it took me an entire, you know, decade, even more to recognize that it's not just about being strong. It's also about our ability to, and there's, you know, four pillars that I've defined now, especially on how to actually build your bounce factor. And this has literally been the core essence of my work. I became so fascinated about human dynamics ever since my parents were in the hospital settings i was a psychology major you know i my my dental practice became a breeding ground for just you know having these psychological conversations with my patients because i was curious at how how our stories how the thoughts we have in our mind how the things that have happened for us or to us how we sometimes make that meaning like I did when I was 10 years old with my great grandmother, with my family and how we can then actually shift that. But it takes four core pillars. And one of them, you know, and the first one is really to be able to make peace and, and, and feel both feelings. I grew up feeling toxically positive because that was my coping mechanism. It was also my coping mechanism to suppress what I was really feeling and suppress the sadness, suppress the grief until it had nowhere to go. It was literally overflowing, which is when I started saying the words, I need help. And those three words shifted everything for me in my relationships, in the way that I led, in the friendships that I had, in the friendships that I let go, because of those three words. And, and that was the, that was the beginning of building this new way of experiencing and growing our resilience. That's not just based on being tough. Oh. As you're speaking, I'm hearing vulnerability is a superpower mm -hmm. Right, asking for help, showing people in of, I, I might look like I got it all, but Ooh, I don't. And I need some help. And what I love that you do in this book is you give people the help, the tools to self-regulate, right? And you have this graph that I'd love for you to walk through our listeners. I think it's so powerful. It's how to embrace the suck moments, right? You have this upward spiral of start here, first step being breathe. And then you work your way up to releasing the stuff. So you can actually feel it. And I think a lot of us, we were never taught how to process our emotions. We were taught you're fine. You're fine. You're Quit, fine. Don't make a scene. Yes. Make so a scene. can you walk us through <laughs> this tool, please? It's also a practice that I have 
when you actually grab the book, I take you through a five day healing practice. And this is one of the resources. It's free. It's for all the book buyers. You can actually get it uh, at thatsucknowwhat.com when you put in the code of wherever your order number of where you got the book. But then it actually walks you through five days of being able to heal the suck, process the suck heal your relationships. Day one, we start out with relationships. Day two, we start out with how we actually move through those sucky moments. Day three, we're talking about, you know, having abundance and creating that life that you want. And four, you know, we talk about having the courage to take brave action, but it doesn't start with out understanding and embracing your emotions. So and the whole idea around this, and I love that, you know, Brooke and Andrea, you have highlighted this page. It's one of my favorites. And you're absolutely right. It's this has been sparked, honestly, through motherhood to see the beauty on the other side and to also see, well, how do our kids, they have the, you know, relentless capacity to just, if they want a toy, if they want candy, my two-year-old is like, you know, she's banging her head on the floor. She's like kicking and screaming. And we've learned not to do any of that. We've learned to suppress. We've learned to numb. We've learned to distract. And boy, do we have some amazing tools for distraction now. You know, we just pick up that phone and we're like, okay, we're going to numb our feelings today. And so for this, it's, I'm actually allowing you to one, embrace the suck. And it starts with putting our hand over our heart and to actually allow yourself to breathe. And this is the biggest thing that you can do for your nervous system because our nervous system, when they're, when we're wired and we have stress and we have all of these things, I grew up in a chaotic household. And sometimes when you have chaos that's happening in life, some people who are listening are probably, you know, maybe going through divorce, maybe going through their own suck in their mind of whatever is not going right. Well, allow yourself to put your hand over your heart. This calms your nervous system down. This acts to activates your rest and digest. And it allows you to just remember to breathe and not just breathe from your chest, but also breathe from your stomach. And what it does is it actually signals your brain to release oxytocin. Because if you think of your hand as that embrace from a caregiver, or caretaker, from when you were six or seven years old, now you can do that for yourself. You don't need anyone. You can be that advocate for you. And then to just breathe and to then experience the suck and experience what didn't go well. So when I ask you to experience it, I'm asking you to, well, bring up whatever feelings that you are feeling. Is it sadness? Is it grief? Is it just disappointment? Is it jealousy? Bring it up. Where do you feel it in your body? Usually when I'm angry or upset, I'll start clenching my teeth or I have tension headaches or my shoulders go up to here. And so I'm, you know, tensing up my shoulders. Where do you feel it? Allow your body to feel that for 60 to 90 seconds. And then what we want to do is you can actually close your eyes or you can keep it open, but notice if you're constricting your shoulders, okay, what are, what are we actually doing? We're we, we want to actually meet that suck, meet it as a friend. And I actually do this as a meditation as well, where we visualize that the suck is in front of you and we give it a picture, we give it a name, we give it a visualization. Uh, usually it's like a circle or a ball, but that we're envisioning it as something that is giving us a signal because guess what? Pain is a signal. It's a signal that, Hey, we're doing too much. Or if you've ever, you know, got up really fast and you're, you, you know, you have one of those days where you spill coffee on your shirt, you bump your knee and then you bump your elbow again. And you're like, what the heck? You know, that is, that's pain. It's an indicator in, in the most superficial form to say, Hey, slow down. Where do we got to go? And so if we can meet that suckiness as a friend to say, Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. It feels, does not feel good to feel this. That's why I want to pick up my phone right now and call someone. That's why I want to go to the, the cupboard and get something to eat. That's why I want to 
use my remote and, and, and Netflix all day, notice what that suckiness is asking you to pay attention to. Oh, wow. Yeah, that breakup. Ooh, seeing that photo of him with another woman. Okay, what does that make me feel? It makes me feel unworthy. It makes me feel really angry that I couldn't control that, right? So allow yourself to feel and notice when you're practicing this, you're releasing the constriction from your body. So if your you know, shoulders are tensed up or if you are grinding your teeth, then maybe you're noticing where you are holding tension and to just release that and to breathe into that. And maybe some more urges will come up. Maybe you will notice, okay, I, I need to hit something. I need to punch something or I need to go for a walk. I can't, I have so much energy bottled up, but these are the things that guess what? Pain is telling you to do something. I think we misjudge when we have anger and rage. And some of us, depending on our upbringing, we're told, Nita, you're strong. Nita, you, you've got this. So I put my anger and rage in a closet where I'm not going to feel that until this all came out for me in postpartum where I couldn't control the emotions that were so overwhelming that I had to reframe that because society tells us that we should just be sugar and spice and everything nice and that we're not supposed to feel. But when we allow ourselves to feel the, the expanse of all of those emotions, then we can start to heal. What we do not feel, we don't heal. And that's what I love about this practice. And I have a few of these in the book. This is just the first um, mini one that I take you guys through to actually notice how those emotions arise in our body. Yeah. I keep thinking about you, like for the first time, allowing those feelings in when you're like, I need help to where you are now. And you can just like hear the work you've done on yourself. You can tell like you've definitely done some therapy. You've thought about what was, where was the first thought where I felt neglected or abandoned? Like it's, I think it's really cool to hear the work that you've done, but I keep thinking about those people that this is new to, right? This is like, this practice is so helpful to get you started to even allow those feelings in. So what was that like for you to go from not feeling anything to feeling it all? Like, where did you go once you knew you needed help? How did that process start for you of, you know, starting to accept that you had these feelings you needed to address? Oh, yes. So I don't know if, you know, I think that for, for me in, in how I was grown up or how I was brought up, we we went to therapy yet because there was so much tragedy in our our life for me as a teenager and i think it was also mandated that they were worried the you know school officials and counselors were worried about my brother and i so it was a different kind of therapy now when i hit my rock bottom after my divorce and my marriage i knew i was just ready to say yes and this is one of the frameworks I also talk about in the book. When you have a fall, and the fall stage is that stage one where you have it's a, you know, it's 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 a medical diagnosis, it's a health challenge that's not getting better. It's a breakup. You find that text, the betrayal text, you find the shock that you've been lied to. That's the fall. And then it encourages you to make a decision. That's the ignition. That's the fire that's lit under your belly or, you know, to actually say, all right, we've got to do something about this. Are you going to see a doctor for that diagnosis? Are you going to stop smoking? Are you going to, uh, you know, what is that next urgent step? Are you going to stay? Are you going to go? Are you going to stay in this situation or are you going to do something about it? So that's that ignition phase. And I was in that ignition phase where the pain got so bad, the threats got so bad that I needed to leave. In the rising stage, when somebody is rising and this is stage three, and this is the most important stage, it's easy to say, no, I'm just going to I'll just avoid it or whatever. But when you're ready to make that shift, like many of you are listening it's uncertain. 
you are okay with the uncertainty because you are committed to making change. And for me, it was asking different people, what did you do? How did you, you know, and asking people for support. And when you ask people for support, the resources come. It's like the Buddha proverb, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Oh, angels were appearing in the form of mentors, advisors. When I let people in, you know, I remember coming into my office and sharing with my dental team that I was going through this divorce and I completely broke down. I couldn't hold it in. And that was the first time they actually saw me, you know, in this most vulnerable state. And I said, if anybody is worried about, you know, their jobs, you you can leave. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, you know, keep this open. I just didn't know. And I was okay in the acceptance of not knowing and not trying to fix. And it was just like here. And so that open the opportunity for people to be like, Hey, you can stay on my couch. You can stay here or here. Let me give you resources. Or, you know, I, I I just went through this myself and I'm so glad you're sharing it here. I'm going to give you, you know, this person to talk to. So they started just the resources started coming and I dove into everything, whether it was books on narcissism and codependency because it was in a codependent relationship and I had attracted and, and had been with narcissists and sociopaths. And so I went through that rabbit hole. I went through talk therapy. I went through, uh, you know, EMDR. I started my, the ancient practice that I saw my dad do for, you know, when I was growing up ever since I was a little girl, the practice of meditation and puja and prayer And with such reverence for it, because I'm like, oh, that's what he was doing. And I started going to temple. I started, you know, I was in a, in a evangelical church group. I said yes to all different Mm -hmm. kinds of community. And I noticed that when I said yes to these communities, I noticed that people were curious about the same things. How do we rise above challenges? How do we speak our truth? And how do we actually move through? these sucky moments. And, and that was the through line. And I started, you know, even saying yes to things like improv and stand up comedy, um, just to get out of my own head of being so in my head and, and the perfection that I had around, oh gosh, you know, when I talk about emotional perfectionism in the book on sometimes how, we have to be, you know, this prim and proper, and there's only one emotion that we can be feeling all the time. And God forbid, you know, we, we, we don't, we, we have a nervous breakdown. Then we're named like the crazy, you know, uh, woman on the street. And it's because society has not normalized that. Yeah, we can have a bad day actually. And that is normal. It is normal to express our range of emotions. And I didn't, see that until obviously, you know, much later when I became a mom and had children, but it was these processes. So, uh, spending time getting to even know myself, I didn't even know what my favorite color was because I was so used to putting everyone else's needs before myself. And I was so used to covering up for other people that this was the first time I was starting to pour into me. And it was very unusual for me to even walk that. So the rising stage is all about, you know, you're wobbly. You're kind of like Phoenix rising from the ashes. You're the toddler that's like getting up, but still falling. Yeah, it's beautiful. And like the toddler who doesn't care because they're standing up and falling again, they're smiling. You're smiling because you're like, I know I'm onto something. And it's going to take time, but you are starting to regain your confidence because you are starting to do things out of your comfort zone and doing things out of your comfort zone invites good stress. And as I talk about one of the pillars to building and increasing your bounce factor is to dive into and invite good stress. And so for me, was it, you know, doing different kinds of workouts. I got very into yoga and I got very into meditation. And that was just, I think it was a way for me to just have that connection with my dad um, in that very healing way. And I knew that 
when I would sit in meditation and go to these groups that had different kinds of meditation, whether it was Kundalini or attached to just regular yoga and Shavasana, that was something that I was doing, if not daily, you know, at least three to four times a week and saying yes to the retreat, saying yes to all different kinds of various different things that would open my worldview. It took me to 45 different countries. Um, nobody needs to do that, but <laughs> what, <laughs> unless you want to, but what in your life can you actually do? And I have a whole list of examples that you can actually do to start in the next phase after rising is magnifying in your life. You know, is it joining a book club? Is it creating a book club? Maybe, you know, you start with this book with a few of your friends or it's joining whatever, you know, meetup group or anything that you want to challenge yourself with. And that was huge for me because one step led to another, led to another, led to another. I created a nonprofit called Independent Awakening. And that was my my nonprofit that taught women and girls the power of self-confidence and using their voice. And, and that led to, you know, coaching and advising and then leadership coaching. And it led to literally my next career, uh, which has been investing and writing books. And so, I mean, what a journey from dentistry into kind of the, some of the avenues, but it was because I led with curiosity and it was because I was so unapologetic about being the tiniest and the smallest fish in the room. And I was so open to healing that I said yes to all of these different things, whether it was in the form of it started with books, then it was with YouTube videos and podcasts like yours. And then, you know, the, and then you'd hear somebody amazing from a podcast and then you'd go and work with them. And, and that's literally how it started. And so I think uh, wherever you are at in the stage and season of life, you know, you're hearing this at a time where maybe you are open to that ignition and you are like, okay, this is, I've got nothing to lose. And that was my mantra. I had nothing to lose. It, it didn't scare me anymore. And I was actually okay being in the discomfort and the uncertainty because I was so used to trying to control everything. I mean, that was, that was my abandonment wound growing up. I needed to be in charge of everything because everything around me was falling apart. And so I ask yourself, if you are curious to know what your patterns were, we actually dive into this in, in uncovering some of that. If you are ready to go there, that's in part two of the book. As you're speaking, it's putting yourself first. It's saying yes, being curious, but a lot of the work is deconditioning what we've been told or caught, right? As we grow up and you speak in the book about the importance of clearing these roadblocks that we have from our upbringing. So I'd love for you to speak a little on that, on your work of deconditioning. Oh gosh. Yes. For me, I had to be okay with not being okay. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest, you know, deconditioning, the biggest unlearning. And, you know, especially if you are taught that, um, in, you know, if like, nope, we're, we're, we're good. You know, we're going to rise up, we're resilient and we keep going and we keep going and we keep going. It's no wonder that, you know, the latest stats are we're, we're in burnout. We are in burnout. i I think I came across an article around mom burnout after the pandemic and mom burnout was real. And even that, um, I think there was another study that was around a third of, of young people are afraid to share, you know, what's really going on. And so we have these mental health struggles alone in silence because everyone's trying to post their best, you know, Instagram photo and life photos, but can we normalize being in the suck? And you know, to, to decondition that that's why this book is called that sucked. Now what? That's why one of the hashtags is embrace the suck. And, and when we're able to embrace the suck or when we're in, able to embrace what sucked, we get away from perfectionism. I'm a recovering perfectionist. 
Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it, that's come, you know, through a ton. Do I notice her when she still comes up? Sure. I think that we all have different parts of ourselves that come up for a reason. And there is the understanding that there is elements of us. I tried to suppress the angry parts of myself because I thought, and I was told when I was little, nope, good girls don't get angry, you know, but it took me a really long time to then go into my own bout with motherhood when I was first pregnant with my son and to feel those enormous, intense, big feelings of postpartum depression that I, and I had no idea why it was so taboo. You know, I was talking and like, it was Kool-Aid basically. Like it was just, it was just like the regular, you know, thing to chat about because with my girlfriends, we all had this understanding that there's something that happens when we are in this kind of postpartum mode after we, our bodies do this really big, huge marathon for ourselves and that things are kind of, you know, in the crosswires, but we're also sitting in not doing for the first time. And it's huge for anyone that's like an ambitious woman or type A or, or someone that is used to controlling things. And so I had to learn to just surrender and let other people take care of me for the first time that I needed to be mothered. And that was huge for me because I didn't know how to receive. And because I didn't know how to receive, I was pushing people off, including my amazing mother-in-law, who's the sweetest. And, uh, and, and my now partner, my, my now husband, was like, what is going on? <laughs> like, where's my wife? <laughs> like, where's, and I had to, again, say, oh my gosh. And I would have visions of back in the hospital when I was a teenager and my dad was diagnosed with stage four cancer and all of that anger was coming up, but I bottled it. But interestingly, what we don't feel, we don't heal because then it would come back around almost 15 years later um, in, in ways where I'm like, oh, wow, thank you, anger, for being here. And yeah, like, all right, I guess I'm, I'm not crazy, but I need to feel this fully. And I talk about, uh, you know, how to create your own rage practice or your own emotional release practice of letting letting things out. And this has, of course, been inspired by my children, my, my two-year-old at the time, he's now four, my son, and chose to really be very aware of, of how we're talking to him about his feelings, because I didn't want to pass down what I was told, even though it's so much easier, so much harder to, you know, be in the suck of a toddler crying for 20 minutes and, uh, versus just saying, you know, what I heard growing up, I'll give you something to cry about if you don't stop right now. Right. And so it, that's easy. But when we know, and when we're deconditioning the things from our parents, things that we don't want to no longer carry in our worldview, it takes courage. It takes bravery. It takes discomfort. It is a little bit harder and I would even start with making a list of some of those things that you're probably like, oh, yeah, I got to unlearn that piece. You know, and the other thing that I had to unlearn is that success was not based on what you're, you know, doing in the world. Because I had, when I left dentistry, that was a huge thing for my family. Huge. I had, you know, tons of debt when going into dental school and taking out loans and things like that. And it was, it was a huge thing to share with my family that I was going to sell my practice that was very lucrative and uh, move cross country to do something completely new that I actually did not know what I was going to be doing. I just knew that I did no longer wanted to be in that world. And 
And that came with a lot of naysayers. It came with a lot of judgments and noise from the outside where I had to clear it and I had to put the blinders on. And so if for you listeners, if you are going through that time, I even had certain members of my family during my divorce stop talking to me because they believe so strongly not in divorce because it would be a bad name for their family that to this day, they they don't talk to me. And I had to make peace with that because my sovereignty, my agency, and I talk a lot about agency in the book, that was, it's, it's my story. It's nobody else's. And in fact, it shouldn't be anyone else's, but yours, because this is your walk and this is your path and other angels and people and, and other friends will come once you release and cut cords and cut ties with those that do not support you in this new season and stage of your life. Yeah. And I keep having that visual in the book when you talk about, I think it's a bulldozer going through the feelings where it's like, you could try and suppress it and keep playing that game. But like you said, you're going to have to move through it. You're going to have to address these relationships at some point where people aren't talking to you and decide how you're going to move through it. And I think that's really powerful. What do you think got you, like gave you the strength to continue on the path that was calling you, even though you had so many naysayers? Well, it was, like I said, it was listening to podcasts like yours. Uh, It was also going to and immersing myself around different communities. When I started saying yes to going to like a entrepreneurial event in a different state, it was, it, you know, I had to travel to this place and just being around other like-minded people who had left their traditional careers, who were working in the online space, who, you know, were doing things like coaching and, uh, and were living it remotely in different parts of the world. I was like, well, how, what, you know, it really opened my eyes to what was possible because I, before that would only go into my dental conferences. And that was the only thing. And, and, and I wasn't opening myself up to other things. I, I said yes to the yoga retreats. I said yes to the meditation retreats. I said yes to the wellness retreats. I said yes to, you know, working with other women in a retreat capacity to say, oh, wow, this. It's just such a, like a different world though. You know, I just keep thinking like, you're literally like flipping your life upside down and, and it's just the badassery to keep going on that path. It's like, it's, it's wild. When you hit rock bottom, (laughs) right. To your point, I have nothing to lose. I have nothing to lose. I only have me to gain like the ownership of this is my life. And if I want different, something has to change. And that's what was kind of the, you know, the, the carrot on the stick. It was like, oh, put me around more of these people. And, you know, the, as the quote, um, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. For me, it was a constant evaluation of, okay, who are the five people that I'm, you know, hanging out with most? Oh, yeah, that's saying a lot. And and at the time when I was going through this, it was, I had my books. It was Wayne Dyer. It was Brian Johnson, Philosopher's Notes. You know, these were, these were my mentors. There's, uh, you know, another book from Oprah that I had because shout out to Chicago. She was such a huge figure there and that's where I grew up. I mean, but these were the things that I like fed in my mind, you know, over and over and over again, especially when I was making some of the hard decisions and then actually going to, you know, saying yes to different opportunities. Um, you know, I, it, it got me to speak at places like Google. It got me to start being curious and actually doing research, which I had to interview, you know, close to 500 people for my first book and to really understand how leaders make decisions. And that was huge because I was under the impression I was so fascinated around how after adverse moments, how leaders can rise. So if they had an adverse moment in their business or a company went bankrupt, how do they actually rise to the next step? And I was just curious around that because I wanted to be a better leader so that I wouldn't have to 
stay in my practice for five days out of the week. And I eventually was able to just be there twice a month. And then I was constantly traveling back and forth, speaking on behalf of my nonprofit. And when I realized, hey, wait, people are asking me to speak, not just on my nonprofit, but for myself, I was like, oh, that's new. That's different. And when I said yes to a nonprofit management course, was a weekend course at Stanford. Um, it was a dream for me to even go there. And I said, uh, sure. Yes. When all of the professors were from the business school at Stanford and they were talking about disrupting and startups and, you know, uh, startup world. And I was, again, the smallest person. I, I didn't go to, you know, business school, but I was the smallest person in that room asking questions on how to make my tiny little nonprofit <laughs> just a little bit better. And because I led with the vulnerability, not with the ego. And I think that has was the one of the superpowers that allowed me to then have these VCs, these venture capitalists to say, hey, what are you doing that you get to leave your dental office. You know, you're a startup too. I didn't even realize I was a startup. So these were just some of the things that started shifting so fast. And then I was getting brought in to, you know, invest in female-led startups. And I was on the advising side because the same things that I was doing in my business was also being able to replicate on the other side to help leaders with their emotional health process conflict and dive into conflict and have better conversations. And, and so I think for anybody that is like on the path or has a lot of naysayers and is just starting out, I think the first thing is let's make peace what we couldn't control. That's the first thing. Let's make peace with what we couldn't control in our past. Maybe it's the past stories we said to ourselves, Maybe it's a deconditioning or an unlearning piece, but that's that first piece is let's make peace with our past. Sometimes it's our upbringing. And the second is, you know, this emotional capacity, allow yourself to feel you are not crazy. You are not broken. You are not a failure. You're just human. And that is okay. What does jealousy say? about you? What does the anchor say about you and about what you're feeling? You know, jealousy is a tool that it shows us that, Hey, why does she get that fancy car and that, you know, that, that house on the lake and the fancy travel? It's only because there's parts of yourself that is suppressing what you truly deeply want in your heart. And you're making excuses as to why you can't have them. But what if you just cut those roadblocks out, start to feel and maybe start to appreciate like, yeah, go, go queen. Like, look at this queen living her best life and doing all of the things that she wants to do. So celebrating more, because when we celebrate more, we are able to be in that energy so that we can also get more and receive more you know, feeling, feeling your feelings is the second one, but the third is inviting and, and doing things that scare you, inviting that good stress. When we're challenging ourselves, we're actually shifting our, you know, brain pathways. Literally, this is like scientifically proven when we do hard things like, I don't know, go in a cold plunge, Andrea, I know you're like an athlete, right? <laughs> that helps with recovery, but it also helps with inflammation that's just on the physical side. But what if we had more difficult conversations? What if we actually led with vulnerability first, instead of asking and saying, oh yeah, I'm fine. Everything's good. Everything's good. You're like, actually, no, let's unpack that. And what's really going on? Sometimes that's the scariest thing for people is to like, mm -hmm. actually do, like, to me, that's not scary. Obviously we'll talk about anything, but to some people that like facing their fears of just saying I'm not okay is like the scariest thing you can do. And that's the work. That's the juicy. That's the, that's the golden, you know, Ivy. That's it. And, and the last part of that is really being okay in building your RSA, which is your radical self-awareness. And this is the radical self-awareness piece where you are in tune and you know that maybe you don't want to go to that party next week. Maybe you've overcommitted in the past and you're like, I'm just so exhausted. I'm just going to honor my body and I'm going to say no. 
and or maybe that nagging friend is constantly all about herself, yet you're so afraid to say, hey, like, I think there's, there's two of us. I'm always there for you. I would really love it if you could just listen to me for once. That's radical self-awareness. That's knowing what is in alignment with you and what no longer is and to be okay with that. That's your bounce factor. You're so inspiring. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all of your gold with us. We could speak about this book to you for six hours, uh, but the first step really is getting this book. Mm -hmm. So where can our audience find your book, find your podcast, get more access to you? Oh, yes. Uh, well, you can get the book wherever books are sold. It's on Amazon. I love Bookshop, bookshop.org. It's great because they do give back to the local uh, retailers and bookstores. So, But if you're also by a, a Barnes & Noble, uh, they are also there as well. And when you actually get the book, um, go ahead to thatsuckednowwhat.com and put in your order number and you can actually get the uh, free 44-page workbook and the five-day free healing practice to get started on your journey of healing. And it comes with everyday 10-minute meditations, kind of like the one that I kind of broke down for us in the beginning of the book. I love it. Thank you so much for all of that. And I just, I keep thinking about how you're just this curious person. Like you've just never stopped asking questions. And I think it takes vulnerability, like you said, to be the smallest fish in the room. It's inspiring me to like continue to learn and know that like admitting that you don't know everything is a superpower. And then to continue to put yourself in those rooms that elevate yourself and to keep that self-awareness is it's just crucial. So I love everything you're saying. And we want to hear from you about what your three gold stars are, your three takeaways for our listeners. Oh, yes. Well, the first thing would be embrace the suck. Embrace the suck and let's be brave to try something new. And I would say the third thing is, you know, the your, your golden ivy is right at the other end of you just saying yes to the adventure. So if, you know, I think you've arrived here for a reason today, and maybe this has sparked that curiosity for you to move through uh, your next chapter with grace, with grit, with toughness and softness, and all of those emotions can coexist at the same time that you don't have to hold it all together. You can be okay to not be okay. I, I want to play that song right now. It's okay not to be okay. Was well, it I think we, Lovato? we need that permission, right? <laughs> of, and that leads me into Unleashing Ivy. Our rapid fire questions is you talk about the, in the very end of the book, the importance of surrendering and throughout the book, it's, it's the work, it's the stages. And then there's the element of just being. So I'd love to hear your take on how do you balance that dance, that dance of doing the work of being curious, following the steps but then being and surrendering. Yeah. So that is that radical self-awareness piece. That's your RSA because I think our head and our ego wants us to go, 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 especially if you're so used to going, that would be a practice for you to slow down. It's, it's actually my daily mantra now is, okay, slow down and receive, slow down and receive. But maybe for some of you where you are so used to taking your time. You are so used to playing small. You are so used to playing in the background that maybe this is your ability to, instead of surrender, because you've constantly surrendered, but this is your ability and this is your opportunity to just, to go do that first thing, do it without thinking about it, you know, and, and have that ability to just say yes to that thing and to, to, to get out of your comfort zone. Um, and see how you grow as a, as you know, as a, as this next phase of you blossoms. Oh, I love that. I love that it can be either direction. We always need to focus on being more. <laughs> so it's like go, go do. Well, that's our own deconditioning right. that we have to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So my question is, you know, when you're talking about thriving, you know, you get in this zone where like things are going really well, you're, you're aware, you're, you're doing, you're chasing your dreams or you're more regulated. And then you talk about how one of the ultimate barriers can be spending time with your family. 
<laughs> so I'm curious how that's shown up for you and how that can be a roadblock for you sometimes. Oh gosh, it has been. Yes. And I think that, you know, I just recently shared some photos of finally taking that, you know, it was like eight month break with my kids and just to be on the beach and soak up the, you know, the ocean medicine vibes. And that was, that was just everything that I needed. But when you're, I think that it's there, there are seasons of that. And I've, because mom guilt comes up a lot for me, especially when my kiddos are, you know, one and four and you want to spend the time with them. And I have people that, you know, then they're like, but this is the only time before five that you have. And then of course there's more mom guilt, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the remembrance that I have is that I would never want my kids to feel resentment for what dreams they are pursuing because they want to be close to mama and that I would love for them to spread their wings. And so the reminder for myself is, yeah, for me to spread my wings, but also when there's, you know, kiddo time and, uh, and, and family time that it's blocked off in the calendar. And that is like, we're going in and it's, everything that we're doing is like fully present and fully there because I know that many times we can be in the same room, but then they're playing with their toys and then, you know, we're doing other things and we're not fully present. But when those moments, when you are, you're actually, you know, diving right into that so that they, they have that. And, and I think we can definitely have our cake and eat it too. Uh, if we're thinking about it in terms of quality over quantity. Yeah. That's a dance too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's tough. Mm-hmm. All right. Nitha, last question. If you could go back and tell younger Nitha one thing, what would you tell her? Be brave F up as much as you can, because that's where, that's where the beauty is, you know, the messy middle. And that's where our biggest expansion is for our own growth. I think for years, I was so afraid of making mistakes and not being perfect and not allowing myself to be seen uh, because I was afraid of being judged and just let it all out because it's, this is, this is the best way and the fastest way we learn. Oh, it's a beautiful reminder. You are a beautiful reminder of life can suck, but we're going to be okay. And we got to lean into the suck and that we will survive and that we can thrive again in multiple ways. And that it will continue to suck at times. You will fail. But like you said, it can actually turn into the most beautiful thing if you just lean into it and feel it and embrace it. So thank you so much for your time, for being here. We feel like you are such a gift. This book is such a gift. And so thank you so much. Oh, thank you, ladies. This was a pleasure, Brooke. Andrea, amazing. Oh, we're so grateful. Our audience gets access to you. We get access to you. And one final thing we would love for, from you is your piece of gold, a quote that speaks to you you'd like to leave us with. That, you know, everything is on the other side of that breakdown. So embrace the suck and have the bravery to rise again anew. This is Gold Ivy signing off. Listen to your truth and go chase your gold. <laughs>